welcome and we will get started. The first thing we're going to ask everyone to do is um, we would like you to rename yourself, uh, just like you've done in previous sessions. This will help us in getting everyone to breakout rooms. So if you're not familiar with this, you click on your name in the or hover over your name in the participant list and go to the three dots. And from there, you should be able to rename yourself. So just like I have an example here on the screen, I put number one, Kim, um, although I'm not in uh, that school district area right now, but just to give you an example. So if we could ask you to please rename yourselves. And Kim, um, just uh, uh, call out or highlight to everyone, we have the link to the Padlet in the chat. And the Padlet has, um, if you go to the action and expression column, it has all the resources we're referencing today. And if you scroll down to the bottom, it also has the participant slides. So you can access them there. We'll also put a direct link to them as well. Oh, yes. Thanks, uh, Kristen. But just to let you know, the, the slides, when you do um, when you do download the slides, um, all the links are in, embedded in the PowerPoint presentation. So all you have to do is click on, click on the underlying um, text, and that will take you straight to the, um, the document or the link that we're talking about. Here you can see Patton's mission statement. Uh, Patton is the training arm of the Bureau of Special Education, and we support the Bureau's efforts and initiatives and strive to build the capacity of our LEAs. We share PD's commitment to the least restrictive environment. Our goal is for every child to be there in their least restrictive environment, starting with a general education setting with the use of supplementary aids and services before considering a more restrictive environment. We hope that you will always include and engage your families in the education of their children. Many years of research has shown the positive effects of family engagement on student learning. Family engagement promotes equitable partnerships among schools, families, and communities to actively advance student achievement through shared commitment, decision-making, and responsibility. And here you can see our hashtag for our family engagement initiative. This is our third deep dive session. You can see here our learning intentions for our time today. And again, if you have any questions um, as we are going through the content, please uh, feel free to type uh, questions or responses into the chat. We would like to start with a discussion on expert learners. UDL has the goal of creating expert learners. Expert learners are defined as purposeful and motivated, resourceful, resourceful and knowledgeable, and strategic and goal-directed. This last characteristic, strategic and goal-directed, aligns to the UDL principles of, for action and expression that we're going to be discussing today. The graphic on the left is taken from the book on learning, Changing Your Beliefs and Your Classroom UDL by Alison Posey and Katie Novak. It eliminates what expert learning can look like. You will have access to these slides, as we said, and you can um, have the access to this information by clicking on the link. Uh, and it will take you to the pilot. Uh, so when looking at the differences between equity and expert learning, uh, the heart of this idea is that student is that the student being an active, part active participating partner in their learning. When you think about students who are interested and goal directed in their learning, what do you see? We're going to do a quick activity. I want you to take one minute to look at this graphic. Think about what you're seeing. At the end of one minute, we'll use a waterfall response in the chat box. I will ask you um, after a minute to type something in that stands out to you from this graphic. And um, but I'm gonna ask you not to press enter or send until I tell you to. And I'll give you a countdown and then post your comment in the chat. Um, so right now I will give you one minute. Just please look at the, the pictures in this graphic.
Okay, as you look at those pictures of the text provided, what resonates with you? What are you seeing? Um, like everyone, just take a few seconds to type your comment into the um, chat box. Okay, are you ready? And I want you to hit enter in three, two, one. Okay, wow, things are coming fast. Okay, so we have um, address the needs of individuals, differentiation, maximize individual student learn, student engagement, give students exactly what they need to be successful, student choice is an expert learner, students drive their own learning, Good students in the third drawing are participating in their learning and have choices that meet their needs. Very good. Um, just a few of these. When needs are met, engagement happens. Uh, this is another version of the baseball image. Yes, I want to talk about that. Absolutely, it is. Uh, we need to be cognizant of individual needs, um, uh, use of different tools to allow everyone to achieve. Not all tools are the same. Really good. See different tools. Variability in the places, tools, and partners. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, um, for sharing those comments. So now, yeah, let's look at the the top of the top picture. Um, this is um, you can see a group of students in the kitchen, and yes, this is just like the um, the other graphic that's out there, the baseball, where you see students trying to watch a baseball game and see over the fence to see the, the field. Um, so if we look at the first um, the first picture. Um, equality, we see that each of the each of the students in this picture is given uh, the same size stool to sit on. They're all given the exact same support and but not all of them can see over the counter to see what's being done. So yeah, it's good might be good for some, but it's not helping everyone. And when we look at the second picture um, and, and think of um, the students in that baseball example where each, each student has a different size box to stand on to see over the fence. So this represents equality. And we see here that the students are given different size stools to sit on so that now they can all see over the counter and they can see what's being done. Now, look at the third picture. And what do you see? This, this picture represents expert learning. You can see a student standing at a small table or desk in, in the front of the picture. So that's her needs or his needs are being met um, and they're standing. So maybe, <clears throat> excuse, maybe that student prefers to stand instead of sitting. That's fine. In the background, you can see a round table where one student is sitting on a stool and another student is standing behind the table. So good, everyone, it looks like they're doing their own thing in their own way. Did you notice though, one thing, look in the, the bottom picture. Who's wearing the chef hat? In the top picture, it looks like the teacher or whoever's um, leading the lesson is wearing the chef hat. But if you look in the third picture, hmm, there's now a student wearing the chef hat and it looks like that student might be leading an activity at that larger table in the background. So just maybe that's the expert learner and they're sharing what they've learned and helping their, their students that are, are in the class with them. So again, thinking about expert learning. So I challenge you as, as you think about things today to keep that in mind and think about expert learners and how you can help develop expert learners. Um, Kim, I'm sorry, this is Kristen. Can I interrupt just one second? Yeah. Um, we've had some people joining. So thank you everybody um, for, for joining. So I just wanted to, um, Remind everybody, we put the link in the uh, to the Padlet and the slides are on the Padlet. Um, Kim, do you mind going back to the um, the number slide where everybody can rename themselves just sure, so um, people can do that? So I'm putting the link to the Padlet and now that's your one stop shop for everything. Um, and then Kim is just revisiting the slide that um, if you can rename yourself to have the number of the LEA that you belong to that will help us later on with breakout rooms. Thank you, Kim. Oh, sure. 
You're welcome. We'll leave that up just for a few minutes so everyone can see. Those of us who are just joining us, we're, we're glad you're here. And I'm going to go fast forward to the next slide. So I'm sorry if, if um, to be changing slides quickly. Here you can see the action and expression guidelines. Today we're going to continue. We, we've used these guidelines and we've used these um, examples and, and graphics um, in previous um, previous deep dives. But today we're so we're continuing with these guidelines, focusing on action and expression. Uh, the third principle of UDL brings us to the how of learning, which focuses on the strategic network of the brain. This is also where the stu where students take over by using their executive functions to set their goals, plan their projects, and deliver evidence of what they know using multiple means of action and expression. On this slide, you see area three in action expression. You see the three areas. There's physical action and expression, uh, physical action, expression and communication, and executive functions. These guidelines offer a set of concrete suggestions that can be applied to any discipline or domain to ensure that all learners can access and participate in meaningful, challenging learning opportunities. Action and expression requires a great deal of strategic strategy, practice, and organization, and is the other area in which learners can differ. In reality, there's not one means of action and expression that will be optimal for all learners. Providing options for action and expression is essential. We're going to take a look at each of these areas. Here you see physical action. And I'm just going to show you that here um, we have the checkpoints. And if you click on this link, let me have your handouts. It will take you to more information and where we've gotten this information. Um, we've, we've used this, um, this site uh, previously in our other deep dives, so it should look familiar. So we know that all learners differ in the ways that they can navigate a learning environment and express what they know. Some might be able to express themselves in written text, but not speech and vice versa. Think about a printed textbook or workbook that you use with your students. Print format provides a limited means of navigation or physical interaction. Students turn the pages, they write in blank spaces. Educational software also similar, similarly provides limited means to navigate and interact with content. This limited interaction will raise barriers for some learners. For example, students with physical disabilities, blindness, dysgraphia, or those students who have uh, difficult with their executive functioning skills. It's, again, it's important to provide materials in which all learners can interact and navigate through materials. Students should be provided with choices and or scaffolding when expressing their knowledge in formative and summative assessments. Uh, not all students are, are completing the same assessments in the same way. Each student should be given a choice for the way they want to show what they have learned. So examples of methods uh, for action and expression. If you're thinking of a math lesson, students are asked to solve an equation. They ha may have the choice of using um, math reference sheets, manipulatives, calculators, just scratch paper and pencil or maybe working in small groups or with a partner. For uh, written tasks, students may choose to write on paper, use an electronic device, or access a graphic organizer or rubric. There are also many different tools and technology that can be used in instruction and assessment. Examples include, but are not limited to, voice-to-text software, manipulatives, um, such things as low tech options all the way up to more advanced um, higher tech options. Um, alternatives to pencil and paper activities and online work. There's not one method of expression that is equally suited for all learners or all kinds of communication. One method of communication may be appropriate and work well for, for, stu for one student and not for another. It's important to provide alternative modalities for expression, both to level the playing field among learners and to allow the learner to appropriately or easily express their knowledge, ideas, and concepts in the learning environment. 
As educators, we should be building the fluency in expression and communication of our students while providing levels of support and practice. So here, um, we use multiple media for communication, uh, use multiple tools for construction and composition, and build fluencies with graduated levels of support and practice for performance. <clears throat> On this slide, you can see some examples. Again, tools can range from hands-on options. Again, we talked, I said about the low tech um, to online and higher level tools and everything in between. It's also important to provide scaffold support for all students who need assistance with a plan to increase their independence and maybe fading back on the amount of support that they need. As you also want to find opportunities, you want to find things that are challenging for other students and help those students who need more support. I just want to pause to see if there are any questions um, in the chat. Have anything? Well, it looks um, it looks good, Kim. Okay, um, Kristen, I'll hand it over to you. Stop my share so you can share your screen. Great, thank you. And Kim, can you see my slides now? I am seeing. Um, not the presentation view, I see um, your view. Okay, um, okay, thank you. How's that? Yes, that's good. Okay, perfect. Um, so hi everybody, I'm Kristen Strosa. Um, like Kim introduced me, I'm one of her colleagues at Pat East, and I'm going to be um, taking you through the rest of the presentation. So, um, Kim went over the first two um, checkpoints, and I'm going to talk a little bit about executive function. Um, executive function is is one of those things that um, we all use, but we don't always think about, and we don't always think about for instruction. Um, I have a scenario or a recollection of a of a college student who is on the autism spectrum and it just tells a story that I think um, it really highlights the why of executive function and um, why we should always be thinking about it and why I'm so glad UDL um, makes a point of it as well. So the this um, recollection that this student has is that um, having a broken alarm clock and having an 8.30 class and being worried about oversleeping for that 8.30 class. And so the only solution that this um, student could think about was to sleep in his college classroom so that he wouldn't miss his 8.30 class um, because of his broken alarm clock. So the, you know, this student probably knew how to go to the store, knew, probably knew how to you know, find the batteries, buy the batteries, you know, take out the take out the old batteries, put the new batteries in. But it was the executive function that was missing um, to put all those steps together. And so I think I've found this um, in this recollection many years ago, and it stuck with me about how it's such an important piece. So I hope it sticks with you and I hope it helps you remember um, to think about that and how you can integrate it into your work with your students. Um, so when we're talking about ex executive functioning within UDL, um, if anyone was at PDE either in person or virtually last week, um, the keynote speaker on Thursday, Lydia, um, they talked about executive dysfunction. So a lot of people I've heard <laughs> kind of um, use that term as well. But if we're thinking about what are the skills we need to function, um, guiding appropriate goal setting. So what are the um, what are we working towards? UDL talks so much about the why and the learning goals and making that explicit for students. Um, so we also want to teach students how to set their own goals, how to plan and strategize and, and work towards those goals. 
um, how to manage information and resources um, so that it's not just, you know, teachers do a lot of the executive functioning for students in K through 12, and then they leave us and they have to um, do all that executive functioning on their own in school or in employment. So um, helping make more explicit and more obvious um, all that manage, how to manage all that information and resources. And then monitoring progress, which is essential to goal setting. We have to know how we're um, doing in terms of meeting that goal that we set for ourselves. So some examples of what executive function could look like. The goal setting, having the learning objectives visible at all times, and not just visible, but an active part of the instruction and the conversation around learning. Providing models and examples, so teachers thinking aloud and not um, showing kind of what's happening beneath the surface and, and helping students to understand what those steps are to make things happen. Um, prompts and scaffolds that help to, you know, estimating time and effort. You know, how many of us have, have um, that issue? You think it's gonna take an hour and it ends up taking two hours. So um, making, making that discussion a part of the conversation and part of instruction. So planning and strategy, you know, the calendars, checklists, schedules, check, checkpoints, chunking um, things out. Um, those are all things that we all depend on and we want to teach our students to figure out what calendar checklist schedule works best for them. How can we um, integrate monitoring progress? We can have check-ins, teacher conferences. Um, we can even use Zoom for that self-reflective writing, surveys and exit tickets. So helping students kind of figure out, okay, I got this far today, what can I do tomorrow? Or this is my goal, um, this is how I'm doing on meeting my goal, I may have to readjust. Um, progress journals and work logs can also help with all of that. I wanted to um, give you guys, this is a link that you can go to yourselves. Um, it's the self-determined learning model of instruction. This is a research-based, evidence-based strategy that has been used with students with disabilities, without disabilities, um, students of all types of learning, learner variability. Um, I The link takes you to a 66-page document, um, so I won't go over all of that, but I wanted to just highlight two pages. Um, page 11, talks about um, what does the self-determined learning model of instruction look like. So it kind of gives you a nice overview of setting the goal, what questions the teacher can ask the student to help them set a goal. Phase two is taking action. So again, um, what the teacher can do to help the student um, implement that goal and identify supports um, Set, set smaller goals along that path. Phase three is adjusting the goal or the plan. So how are things going? What actions have I taken? What barriers um, have I identified and need to adjust for? Do I have to change anything? So I think you'll see that this self-determined learning model of instruction gives you kind of a way to integrate um, goal setting and executive functioning into your instruction. Um, so, you know, this is a good example to explore further if you want more information. At the end of the document, I just um, went ahead to page 55. It gives you examples of what this might look like, um, you know, a kind of um, structure that you can use with the students and what goals they set for themselves. Um, and just gives you kind of, like I said, a more concrete example of what it might look like. So this is phase one for Amy. She wants to talk to classmates during English class. This is what she currently knows about it, what she must change for her to learn what she doesn't know, um, and what can she do to make this happen. So that's the phase one. Phase two, um, is her taking action. So her, 
implementing the steps to reach that goal and her reflecting on where she has been with that goal. And then phase three is um, adjusting goal or plan. So what barriers have been removed? What has changed about what she didn't know? And do I know what I want to know? You know, it, it, have you met the goal and are you happy with that? So again, a, a good resource to explore if you're looking for more information about that. So anything in the chat, Kim, that I need to address? Kim or Lisa? No, there's nothing in the chat, just some thank yous. And um, thank you to Lisa because she has posted um, all the links in oh, the great. chat that you need to access the information. Great, awesome, yes. An essential part of a Zoom webinar. Thank you so much. So, um, so Kim and I have given you an overview of um, action and expression and given you some things to think about and some ways to integrate it into your, um, into your classroom and into your instruction. So what we wanted to do at this point um, is play a clip from a video. It's just about three minutes of this larger 12 minute video. And in this video, um, you're, you're going to, it's centered on the student, Tasha. And this is a mini, uh, like a mini movie from Dan Habib um, in his larger series for including Samuel. So some of you may be familiar with that video. Um, some of you may want to look into it after seeing this mini movie. Um, so, we're going to see um, Tasha and we're going to see some of her classroom, some of her use of an AEC device. We're going to see um, some of the instruction that they're working on with Tasha. And we're definitely going to see Tasha and her classmates. So in looking at this, this video clip, we want to, um, it's just the classroom. <laughs> so, and some instruction, and it's an inclusive classroom. So, it's an opportunity for you to look at this from a couple of different lenses. So, one lens we want you to look at it through is the action and expression lens. So, do you see examples of the action and expression that we talked about this morning so far? As you're looking through this, now this video was done probably at least 15 years ago, um, but what additional ideas for action and expression do you see that maybe the teacher could do if, um, if you know, they were targeting that? If you see other examples of UDL, the other principles, you can certainly think about that as well. But we, so that's the second point. We also want you to think about this as you know, sometimes we get into UDL um, kind of from an individual perspective. Obviously, UDL is universal. So we're supposed to be thinking about all students, all the learner variability that those students bring. Um, but this student, this is focused on, on Tasha. And when we think about Tasha, we think about, well, sometimes things that work for Tasha could work for all students. So what examples do you see of the idea of what works for one student could work for many students? And I, I think that's a thought that we think of a lot when we are talking about UDL and how to integrate it into our classroom. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, like I said, we'll show you a clip of this video. Um, we're going to put you in, in breakout rooms and we have a jam board to help you with um, document your discussion. So each, so the first three slides on the Jamboard um, are where you can take a sticky note and post your reflections on it. So the first question, the second question, and then the third question. So I will go back and I have the video queued up here for Tasha. Um, We'll watch it together and then I'll put you in breakout rooms. So um, we'll get this started. So in the when we start the clip, um, her, this is either the speech therapist or the special ed teacher, I'm not sure. Um, she is gonna be talking about Tasha and some of the work they're doing with her. 
Okay. Thin. It was another very thin, easy to pour liquid. How many states of matter are there again? Three. Three. There are three states of matter. And what are the When Tasha came to my. Just pausing it to make sure everybody can see and the sound is okay. Is that okay? Is everything okay? It's coming through clear, Kristen. Thank you. Great. I will continue then. My class last year, she had a very basic, what we called a talk box, so a augmentative communication device. And it had like five basic pages of pre-programmed things and she used it in structured settings that were the same all the time so we could make calendar one of the pages that worked all the time. But we found that she was wanting to say and was more engaged than that device allowed. And finally last May, we were able to purchase the district that did um, the Vantage Light for her to use. She is usually able to go through multiple steps to finding different things that she wants to say. I You're a snack? <laughs> the team itself went to a lot of trainings on how to support her using it, and she became a lot more involved in the classroom that way, socially and academically. So we were able to make pages that connected to every lesson in the room instead of just the things that happened every day all the time, as well as social pages of asking questions and telling jokes. And we found that once she got that, there were joke pages on it, and during snack time, all of the kids would come over and they'd ask her to tell them a joke. <laughs> they would ask if they could touch it too. Did Caitlin try? Yes or no? Did Caitlin try? Yes or no? I said go. Yes. Since Tasha has had her device, her behaviors have decreased. In the small amount of time that she's had the device, it's also really increased her verbal output. She is saying all kinds of different things. Who is this? Have a library on Friday. You do. I begin. I think with this device and from the help of her teachers, she's uh, learning more and more. I go to Mrs. B. Go to Mrs. B. ini with this uh, at home she speaks sentences that she would never speak before. Yeah. She when I first started here at recess time and at lunch time would just kind of be by herself. But this year she's really become very socially aware of what's going on in the class and wanting to be with her friends and sit by them and do what they're doing. I've been out on the playground before for recess due. So I'm gonna stop it there. So we um again, you can go to the jam board. I saw a lot of people joining, so um Lisa, I'm sure, has put the link in the chat. Um, you can go to the Jamboard. We'll put you in your breakout rooms. Your breakout rooms currently are assigned um, by your LEA. So um, if anyone hasn't been assigned, once I open the rooms, um, hang tight and I will get you assigned. Go into your breakout rooms, consider the three questions um, presented here in, in Jamboards one, two, and three. Um, and we'll give you a little bit of warning before you come all back. All right, I am going to open the rooms. If I can get a little bit of silence. It's the idea that the barriers to learning are in the environment, not in the student. So when when we're thinking, we have sometimes we have to convert that because we're kind of so conditioned and and um, it, it's just. Um, fortunately, it's just kind of an automatic thought that we think about um, barriers in the student as opposed to in the environment. So what we want to do, and I'll escape out of here and, and um, so I can go to the Jamboard in a minute. Um, in, in the Jamboard, we have slides four through eight, have, a have each slide has a barrier written as if the barrier were in the student. So we want you to pick at least one of those barriers. If you have time, you can go to more, but pick one of those barriers and um, convert it. You know, So take it from being written for the student and convert it into um, what is 
is the barrier in the environment. Um, also discuss, we will put you back in your breakout rooms, but also discuss are the barriers in, in the environment, are they in the area of engagement, representation, or action and expression? So let me show you what that looks like on the Jamboard. So we have, um, so this one, the student has difficulty with multi-step directions and projects. Um, for, on each Jamboard, we put a post-it note there that has the link to the UDL guidelines. If you want to go back to it, you just have to copy and paste the link into your browser. Um, the student has difficulty with group work. The student has difficulty writing a response to describe the difference between metamorphic and Ignatius rocks. And if you get to slide seven and eight, the first three are kind of traditional. This one, the student doesn't recognize Jabba's palace at the end of the Mandalorian season two. What barrier is that to understanding it? And the student does not know Sarlacc, Rancor, or Beskar and is watching the Book of Boba Fett. So if you want a non-traditional example, you can pick the last two. If you want more traditional examples, you can pick the first three. So we'll put you back in your breakout rooms. We'll also tack on a couple of minutes for you guys to take a stretch break because um, we're entering our second um, hour of the session. So um, we'll put you back in your breakout rooms. We'll give you like five to seven minutes to do this activity um, and take a little break. And we'll give you a warning before we were engaging in that activity. I hope you guys got a little break too. Um, we were enjoying it, seeing all the post-it notes um, go up. So um, we're grateful that you took the time to kind of work through this activity and, and make that kind of thinking switch to define barriers in the environment. Lots of great ideas here. Um, about the multi-step directions, um, presenting them visually one at a time, task analysis, teacher modeling, um, visualization of each step, discuss each step before moving on, um, group work, so setting a goal, um, engagement, yeah, definitely anxiety about with peers, that's a consideration, discussing group norms, that makes a lot of sense. Um, furniture can be a possible barrier to engagement. Absolutely. Um, let's see. So this was one that got, got a lot of discussion back in the main room, but I'm um, talking about the differences between rocks. Um, so writing a response to describing that. So consider text the speech to text. Absolutely. Um, vocabulary and oral response. Yeah, describe doesn't require writing. So are, is there flexibility with that? And we'll talk about that um, a little bit more when we talk about assessment. So that's a good preview to that. Um, and so, yeah, there were um, discussion about this um, <laughs> lack of interest that just stuck right to my heart. I can't imagine anyone not being interested in the Mandalorian or the Book of Boba Fett, um, but I, there is learner variability out there, so I do have to acknowledge that. <laughs> so, no, thank you guys for um, engaging in in um, some of the um, non-traditional examples too. So, thank you for that. All right. So, um, so I like I said, this barrier discussion will definitely translate to um, the next section that we're going to talk about, which is assessment. Um, before we get to that section, um, just another kind of food for thought. Um, sometimes when we talk about removing barriers, you know, some people may say, well, we can't remove every barrier, you know, um, and, or are we gonna make things, you know, too easy if we remove all these barriers? Um, so I, this slide just provides a quote about productive struggle. Um, the goal is not to make everything easy and make everything, you know, so that um, there is no productive struggle. It's really the difference between unproductive struggle versus productive struggle. We want to keep that productive struggle in. And I thought that this quote was a good example of that. So as students engage with a task, 
they must be mindful about the strategy they employ and assess whether it is productive. So Kim started off our session talking about expert learners and expert learners are strategic, they're goal oriented, um, you know, so that really is talking about the action and expression that that is the focus of today. Um, when they find they are at a dead end, they must be willing to ab abandon one strategy for another. When students labor and struggle, but continue to try to make sense of a problem, they are engaging in a productive struggle. So again, when we're thinking about barriers and thinking about removing barriers, we want to remove those barriers that are unproductive, but we want to help students become that expert learner. And so we don't want to remove remove every barrier make everything easier and by doing that eliminating um, the opportunity for them to develop themselves as an expert learner so again just another food for thought so um the the last section of today is talking about assessment and udls so when we're talking about assessment and udl and there are a number of UDL tip sheets that I reference in these next two slides on um, that are on the Padlet and are really good resources to have. And I wanted to make sure we highlighted them. So when we talk about UDL, you know, learning goals are paramount. So we want to make sure we're aligning assessments to those learning goals. We want to make sure that we're assessing what we're teaching and what the goal of the instruction is. So by identifying the learning goals and having that thinking of aligning the assessment to those learning goals, we can identify and remove barriers within assessments that aren't required to assess the learning goals. So the learning goal is the non-negotiable, but all those other barriers, if they're not aligned to that, then it's a barrier that we, we don't, we don't, we can remove or can consider removing. So some questions that can help you with that, does my assessment align with my learning goals? What barriers are there in my assessment that may impact my learner's ability to show what they know? And how could flexible assessment options reduce those barriers? So those are some really good questions to help you think through. And um, in a couple of slides, we'll be watching a video that um, kind of gives examples of that. Being flexible in your means is another um, highlight that we have to think about with assessment and UDL. So the means are the different ways learners perform tasks, engage with the materials, make meaning of it, and show what they know. So the means are, are where we can be flexible. So like in that, um, the last Jamboard that we did, the one example about the different types of rocks, the prompt was describe the differences. So describe can mean many things. If we're only thinking about it as writing, we may be putting in some barriers that we don't need to have. Um, so what are other ways um, that we can be flexible to get at that goal of describing the differences? So some questions um, in this learning opportunity, how are there flexible options for learners to achieve the goal? Are there some options that are consistently available so that learners can always rely on them? So UDL talks a lot about choice. So this, this prompt is saying that it's a good thing to have some kind of standard choices across tasks and across lessons and content so that students know that that's always an option for them. Are all of the options I provide accessible to all my learners? Um, are there barriers some that some may encounter? Have I overwhelmed my learners with too many options? Um, I tend to do that. Um, so that that's a very that's one that sticks out to me. You know, choices are great, but if it takes a student, you know, an hour to to assess all the choices, then maybe there's too many. Um, and are there ways I can optimize the choices I provide? So again, these are some good guiding questions to keep in mind, and these UDL tip sheets are, are good to have on hand. So we're going to, um, what this is um, a video from CAST. It is divided into um, two chapters, chapter one and chapter two. They're each about five minutes long. 
Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to view um, we're going to view the chapters uh, chapter one together, um, and then we're going to put you in, in, back into your breakout rooms and give you the opportunity to make some choices. So you can, after we view chapter one together, when you go in your breakout room, you can discuss what you heard in chapter one. Um, if you want to continue with the video in the breakout room, you can view chapter two and discuss. Um, chapter two just kind of goes into more detail about what they talked about in chapter one. Um, if you don't want to do either of those, uh, another option is to um, review the CAST UVL tips for assessment um, resource and, and discuss um, the questions on the Jamboard. So um, we'll view chapter one together, and then when you go into your breakout rooms, you can make those choices about what you want to do. So um, I'm going to play this, and um, we'll... I'll review your choices once before we go in back into breakout rooms. This video is about empowering teachers. Yes, we want those of you who have to use assessment in your classroom all of the time to understand how assessment people think so you can evaluate when assessment is working and when it's not and where exactly the breakdown is happening. Think about driving a car. You might learn to drive the car I just want to pause to make sure, can someone let me know if the sound and the visual is all good? Hey, Kristen, the sound is coming through fine. Um, there is a gray box over some of the closed captioning. I don't know if you are able to move that box so that all of the captioning is visible. I think that is the Zoom okay. captioning happening. I don't have anything over my screen. So okay. I apologize about that. Kristen, it may be your, your Zoom control bar, so if you can maybe just reposition that. Okay. Although we can't see the contents, it looks like we might be seeing the, the block okay. uh, showing where they are. Okay. I'm Yeah, I'll try to make sure that's minimized. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. To get around from point A to B. And most of the time, you don't need to know how to change the oil or fix a flat tire. But if you know these things, then you really know your car and you know how it's put together. Except in this case, what we are going to do is expose the assessment engine so that we can understand how it runs. Right. Understanding how things works always helps. So let's get started. We want to use assessments to find out where kids are and how they learn best and what we can design to support their learning. Closely evaluating the assessments will give us that information to do that. When evaluated assessments, one of the first items we need to focus on is understanding construct. Assessments are designed to measure knowledge, skills, and abilities, right? Constructs are the knowledge, skills, or abilities being measured by an assessment item. Seems very straightforward. We want assessments to measure evidence of how well students have achieved or made progress toward the learning goal. Exactly. The problem is many assessment items include features, information, requirements, big words, that are not relevant to understanding the student's knowledge, skill, or ability. Very often, the methods or materials used in assessment demand additional skills or understanding not directly connected to what's being measured or tested. These are considered to be construct irrelevant. Construct irrelevant features can create barriers for some students, preventing an accurate measurement of the construct that the teacher wants to measure. Basically, construct irrelevant features can impact the student's ability to show what they really know or what they can really do. Yes, for example, consider a math assessment that includes word problems to assess a student's understanding of a math concept. In this case, the ability to read fluently is construct irrelevant, meaning it's separate from the ability to do math problems and calculations. The barrier may be in the student's reading ability and not in their math ability. Even though reading is an important skill, right, Tracy? Yes, it's totally important, but it's not part of the construct that's being measured by the math teacher for this particular lesson. So what is the goal in measuring this construct, reading or math? Or think of a time test in science that students answer by handwriting. Handwriting requires motor coordination. Some kids have terrible handwriting, but they might still know a lot about the science skills or the life cycle of a plant even though they cannot express it clearly in the written form. The barrier is the handwriting, not their science understanding. 
Working under time pressure could also be a barrier for some students, and it doesn't really help the science teacher get an accurate picture of the student's knowledge of biology. Exactly. Now, see how analyzing assessments works in practice. I brought a great example with me. For this assessment, the English teacher asks students to take a spelling test. So let me set the scene. The construct this teacher wants to measure is the student's ability to spell words. Think about all the subtasks that are also included in the spelling test as I tell you about it. First, the teacher asks the students to take a blank sheet of paper that's lined and number it 1 to 20 on the left side of the page on every other line. Then she told them that they should write their answers next to the number as she said the words aloud. The teacher had a really nice dictation structure and a very clear structure to ensure that the students would hear the words. First, the word was said out loud, then it was used in context in a sentence, and then it was repeated again. After the test, the student handed in their work. So here is one student's paper. If you take a look, you can see some numbers, you can recognize some letters, but some of them you can't. It's difficult to read any words on that page. So think about the construct that was being measured. The spelling. Then ask yourself, were there any construct irrelevant tasks that were built into this assessment that prevented us from measuring this student's ability to show what they know in how to spell? I'm thinking, yes. Right, in this case, the teacher looked at the student's paper and was quite surprised. The student was always engaged, answering questions, and seemed to have no trouble spelling the words or discussing them during classes. The teacher was so concerned that he decided to give his student the same assessment in a different way. The teacher asked the student to spell the words out loud. And you know what? The student spelled every single word correctly. All 20. That's so useful, Tracy because it really demonstrates that when we build assessments that focus on the construct, on the content and the skills, we get a clear understanding of the student's abilities, but we also isolate variables. I mean, maybe the student does need some support with writing or math, but at least now we can clearly see the interventions that that student needs. The other thing I like about this example is how the teacher incorporated formative assessment through observation into their decision-making process and into the design of their assessment. The teacher can now empower the student by talking about the learning process. The teacher can help the student become more aware of the way they learn and help them articulate their learning needs. So I hope um, you kind of heard some things that we've been talking about today, um, the construct relevant versus irrelevant, um, you know, being flexible in our means, which, uh, which means matches the construct and which means does not. Um, so I hope, um, you know, some connections are being made. So um, like I said, we're going to put you back into your breakout rooms. Um, so how you have a choice. Um, your option one, you can discuss what we just listened to as the larger group and um, respond to these questions here on this um, slide. So that's option one. Option two, you can continue to view the video and consider the questions. And here is the, the yellow um, post-it has the link to the, to the video. Or option three, you can, um, review the CAST UDL tips for assessment, which is linked on the yellow post-it, and consider these two questions on the slide. So option one, two, or three when you go into breakout rooms is your choice. Um, any questions on that? Thank you, Lisa, for all the links. And um, we'll give you probably at least eight minutes for this um, for this activity because especially if anyone chooses option two um, but we'll definitely broadcast a message to give you a warning all right i'm going to open up the all right so everybody is coming back now thank you all looks like everybody's back um, so I hope um, you guys got something out of that chapter one of the video, um, maybe even um, started to look at chapter two as well. Um, there's lots of 
um, discussion on the on the post-it notes, we were commenting how, well, I was commenting how grateful I am for Jamboards to help us um, with this discussion. Um, so it looks like a lot of groups um, chose to reflect on, on chapter one and talked about, um, you know, just the thinking about barriers to learning and, and things that this video brought up for you. Um, word problems on math tests. Um, there was actually, I went to a session at PBE last week um, about word problems and strategies for it. And the speaker really addressed intervention with that from almost a reading comprehension viewpoint, <laughs> you know, that sometimes the struggle with word problems is more about reading comprehension. So I thought that was an interesting um, take. Um, teachers often create tests with their own learning style in mind and not those of their students. Um, being aware of the construct irrelevant topics, definitely. Um, you know, PSSA math questions, um, you know, related to word problems. That's definitely a struggle and a bit of a cognitive dissonance between, you know, what we know universal design is asking us to do, but then the structure and the rigidity of the test, because it is that standardized test. So that's that's definitely a struggle um, that that um, teachers, families, students, us have to um, work through. So it can definitely understand that. Um, barriers that students are facing, a lot about math tests, um, teacher mindset, teach to the test mindset, high, st yeah, high stakes testing, definitely. Um, I'm sure that's on everyone's mind given that it's almost testing or is testing season for some of us. So um, definitely understand that. Um, yeah, discrepancy between formative assessments and summative assessments, definitely multiple levels of irrelevant measurements. So great. It sounds like there was a lot of great discussion going on in the in the rooms. I hope it was helpful and um, you know you keep keep that video bookmarked. It may be one that you want to want to go back to because it's a really it's a really good video and short. Um, so it kind of checks all the boxes, <laughs> all the boxes there. Um, so we wanted to um, just close out with a couple of resources that might be helpful to you and your teams when you're thinking about um, how to translate these UDL conversations that you're having here, how to translate and communicate and, and talk with your colleagues that are outside of your team. Um, so. One of them is um, about UDL Miss. Um, so I can click on this just real quick. Um, I thought we were going to have time to go into breakout rooms again, but now I'm looking at the time and I think I talked too long. So <laughs> I'm not sure that we're going to have time to go back into breakout rooms. But um, this this link just takes you to different um, UDL Miss um, and kind of how to respond to them or like a clarification about why they are myths and not true. So this resource might be helpful, um, you know, as a discussion activity, when you're talking to people outside your team, it might be helpful within your team to, um, you know, talk through some possible barriers or arguments that you may get against UDL, so to speak. Um, so, so that's an option um, for you. Um, UDL vision. Um, some of the activities and resources that we pulled for this um, session were taken from the Thai Center. The Thai Center worked with CAST um, to develop UDL mo modules themselves. The Thai Center is an inclusion um, focused center. Um, so I took in one of their modules and one of the activities, they had this idea of developing like a UDL vision. So they had these um, these kind of sentence starters about if you're envisioning what UDL would look like in your classroom. So when I visualize UDL in my classroom, I see, I hear students, teachers are, the learning space looks like. So I thought that UDL vision, these, these prompts or sentence starters might be helpful if you're working within your team, you know, that might be helpful to kind of solidify 
what you're working towards. It might be helpful in conversations with your colleagues if you're expanding your UDL work um, outside of your team. So those are two um, resources that you might want to think about and consider um, for, for the future. So I think it's best um, if I just turn it over now to Jeff and he will close out with our closing comments. Great, thank you, Kristen. Um, before I formally close the session, I just want to drop uh, a quick link into the chat box for everyone. This is a direct link to uh, Patents Inclusive Practices Resource Hub. This is a new resource that we have been building uh, throughout this school year. It will continue to build and grow, uh, but it is ready for your use. Maybe you already have this link and you've already started uh, checking here for additional information. Uh, the, the link that I gave you directly, uh, it goes directly to our uh, Universal Design for Learning page of the Resource Hub, uh, but there is much more to the Hub than just Universal Design for Learning. So please, uh, at your leisure, um, check that out and, and you'll definitely find uh, updates uh, with regards to uh, videos very similar to uh, what we just viewed a moment ago uh, about assessment. You might find videos that help uh, you to grow in your universal design for learning journey. Uh, and we continue um, to ramp up how we are bringing this information to the field. Uh, one of those ways is through a Twitter post, a weekly Twitter post where we have been elevating certain parts of universal design for learning, uh, providing timely resources, and we duplicate those posts here on our resource hub. So if you're not a Twitter user, and uh, I am not, or at least I was not uh, until about a month ago, uh, I'm growing as well. Um, but if you're not a Twitter user, uh, certainly you can find the similar information on our resource hub. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone for being with us, not just today, uh, but throughout this uh, UDL journey, through all three of our deep dives. Um, we certainly have been learning and growing uh, in this process, and it can be overwhelming. Uh, we have taken a very uh, specific pointed look at the three principles. We began with engagement and moved into representation. Uh, and today, of course, we talked about action and expression. While we looked at those individually, uh, I just keep being reminded um, that they all work hand in hand. And something that you do to remove a barrier uh, so that a student can demonstrate their learning may actually increase their engagement because they're no longer fearful of maybe being forced into a pathway that doesn't meet their, uh, their learner variability or doesn't uh, eliminate a barrier for them um, to show what they've learned. So these do really work hand in hand, uh, which is just a good reminder of, you know, how do we simplify this thing called UDL? And, and the best way to do that uh, is to just always remember, we enter into every learning environment, every learning activity, every learning uh, instructional opportunity, every assessment, we enter into all of those arenas with a goal in mind. So always begin with a clear goal. And then think about that goal and think about your learners and think, are there any barriers for my learners to achieve this goal? And if there are, then start removing those barriers by considering options. And if you can, determine, is that barrier an engagement barrier? Is it a representation barrier? Is it an action and expression barrier? That will help you to focus what options potentially you should supply your learners. Also consider the learner variability. Um, just like we think about our GPS, uh, depending on the- This meeting is being recorded. So again, thank you for being with us. Um, I'm going to place now into the chat box uh, the form site link uh, to your session verification form. You can also scan the QR code that is on the screen. It will take you to the same form. We ask that uh, whether it be here in just a few moments or sometime later today, uh, but we, we do ask that you, you complete this session verification form. And I wanna remind you that um, while some of your peers may not have been available to join us today, and that's completely understandable, uh, we do ask that uh, at their convenience, they watch the recording of this uh, session and also complete the session verification form. Where do you find these materials? If you haven't captured them today, they are on the Padlet. I'm gonna ask that um, one of my colleagues post that Padlet link just one more time. Uh, the slides are already on the Padlet. This QR code, uh, you can link directly from the Padlet from those slides. And within the next couple of days, we'll also post the session recording to the Padlet uh, so that anybody can come back to it uh, or any who were not with us will have access to it. Um, 
If you have not already done so, uh, please be in communication with your patent point of contact in order to schedule your next uh, site visit, uh, which does need to be completed sometime between now and before our next session, our final session. Uh, and that is our statewide culminating session, which is scheduled for May the 12th. During um, the, your final site visit, your patent point of contact will review some of the specific details for that culminating session. But generally speaking, in that culminating session, we wanna hear from you. Uh, you've heard from us several times now. We wanna hear from you. We wanna hear about your journey. So each team will have five to 10 minutes. And during that, that time period, you, you are asked to share out on your UDL efforts throughout this grant process. Um, your team can consider sharing topics uh, such as the resources or strategies that you found to be helpful uh, as you've learned more about UDL. Maybe some obstacles or barriers that you experienced and how you over overcame those barriers, excuse me, overcame those barriers at your site. Um, we, we hope that you could possibly share your vision for how this work will continue at your site. Um, how will you continue to implement UDL in your classrooms, maybe um, beyond your classrooms and, and scaling implementation into your grade level, your department, your building, or, or potentially even district wide? Um, anything that you feel is worth highlighting that another team uh, may benefit from because we all have approached this journey uh, in a context specific to our sites. So we look forward to hearing that. Um, now, how will you share this information? The choice is yours. Um, you may just have some talking points. You may decide to put together a few slides or an infographic or a Powtoon. Um, the, the choice is yours for how you share. Um, we're not concerned as much with, with the delivery method as we are just an opportunity to learn from each other. All 15 teams will have a chance to listen and learn. And certainly um, we will take something away that we didn't think of in our site uh, and, and say, ooh, I like that. I wanna try that too. And that's the purpose of this professional sharing. It's also a reminder that we have now become a, a, a community, a universal design for learning, uh, universal design for learning community. And uh, as I sit and listen to the presentations and I say, ooh, Elena had something great and I'm gonna follow back up with Union because I wanna learn more about how Union did that so I can try that at my site. Um, so it's a good opportunity for us to, to take this, uh, this community beyond just the life of the grant and continue to tap into each other and learn from each other and, and grow in this journey. If you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to your patent point of contact or your regional office lead. And I again wanna thank you for your time today uh, and have a great rest of the week and a weekend to come. Have a great day, everyone. Oh, I see a question about, um, can I send gui guidelines on how many slides, expectations? Um, Jessica, great question. And, and really, uh, I hate to say it this way, but there's no expectation. Uh, you might have one slide that just helps you know, visually cue what you wanna talk about. Um, it, we're really looking at, uh, an opportunity for you to give an, uh, a reflection, a summary of how your team has approached universal design for learning. I know as teachers, we, we like those guidelines. Give me five slides, or uh, I'm gonna tell you, you have five to 10 minutes to share and how 